Morning. David Davis clearly not, not present as sad. <laughs> um, however, you, you, you have I been, hope so. You have been speaking to this man who is regarded around the world as one of the most bloodthirsty and evil dictators going. How did you find him? Well, you've got to start with the fact that he does oversee a regime which uh, murders and tortures prisoners mm. uh, and carries out barrel bombing. Uh, he was polite, courteous. Um, we had warned him before we arrived that we were going to be very frank with him, and his opening words were, please be blunt. So we were. Uh, so you asked him about the barrel bombs yeah. and the torture and so in forth, and how did he respond? In particular, my colleague uh, Adam Holloway is <laughs> incredibly fierce about it. He sort of sidestepped the barrel bomb uh, argument, but on the, on the torture and killing of prisoners, he tried to claim that that was down to... Uh, enemy propaganda, as it were. He said, you know, our opponents are very good at online propaganda. Now, of course, that may be true to some extent, mm. but the, the simple truth is, two years ago, a British citizen, uh, uh, Dr. Um, Asai Khan, was kill tortured, we think, and killed in, uh, in, uh, in their custody. Uh, and there's other mm. evidence to indicate it's still going on. So uh, other ministers in his government said, oh, put it down to revenge and their lack of control. But the simple truth is it's still there. Now, of course, his <coughs> troops are in Palmyra now and they're, they're moving forward mm. again thanks to President Putin's intervention. Did he talk to you about that? And does, do you think he feels safe as a result of President well, Putin doing what he did? absolutely. I asked him about it, Putin because I was quite interested in why Putin downscaled what, what they were doing. I mean, the, the Russian intervention, you're quite right, actually completely put the Syrian army back on its feet. Uh, and so I asked him why has he downscaled it. He said because uh, Russia was being criticised for stalling the talks, taking away the incentive for him to negotiate. But then there was a line that came out of it, almost as a throwaway line. He said, but uh, Putin said, we will not let you lose. Wow. Uh, which for me was, in fact, in some ways, the most important phrase of the entire visit. Because that actually defines what the outcomes are going to be. If the Russians will not let them lose, then there are two possible outcomes. I mean, the, the jihadist victory, which would be a disaster in my view, by the way, the jihadist victory is, is not on the cards, but either a negotiation, uh, negotiated outcome, or uh, a Syrian victory is on the cards. It wasn't long ago we were being told of 70,000 um, moderate Syrian fighters taking on the regime by the government. Any sign of that at all? No. Um, we talked to a lot of other people. Where we could, we talked to people like NGOs and, and, and uh, journalists both inside mm. uh, Damascus and in Beirut. And the, uh, the, the most, the most uh, telling comment was from an NGO, a very good NGO leader uh, in Damascus, who said that there is nobody that the West would recognise as a moderate uh, mm. amongst the, the various sorts of jihadists and so-called freedom fighters. So it's an unappetising choice between sticking with Assad and the Russians on the one hand and allowing complete turmoil of extremist groups on the other. Is there any other way forward? Well, there is a negotiated outcome. The, the, what, the reason I went in the first place was because Europe's biggest two problems are massive security problems, a thousand jihadists a year arriving in Europe, and tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of, of refugees. Both of those go back to the Syrian conflict. The longer it goes on, the longer negotiation goes on, the worse that will be. We won't be able to cope mm. with it. So outcomes. Uh, either a Syrian government victory, which will take a long time, um, or a negotiated outcome. At the moment, just under the, with Syria, just under the aegis of the Russians, who are not going to stop them torturing, who are not going to stop them mm. killing their prisoners. So it seems to me the, the West has got to get a card uh, in this game. Mm. And uh, I think one of the most important things the West could do is draft, as it were, a martial plan for Syria, rebuild Syria. Syria used to be the Germany of the Levant. Breadbasket, pharmaceuticals, yeah. textiles, you name it. But it then allows us to say to them, you want this? You've got, to, you've got to negotiate properly. You've got to do what we want, which is create a civilised regime. I mean, is, 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 Do you take the view that Assad eventually must go? I think, I mean, the other thing this NGO head said was if Assad stood for government, stood for election tomorrow, he would win. When he stood a, uh, a few years ago, they've had a general election this week, which is a bit of a farce, frankly. But when he stood a few years ago, he got 63% of the vote. Now he'd probably get more because everybody's terrified of the alternative. Not because they yeah. like him, but they're terrified of the alternative. So we've got to leave that to the British. I think we've got to leave that to, to the Syrian people. So you think the West should put, put Assad out? off the table for the moment. Talk to, if you were in the yeah. Foreign Office, I you'd be that, talking to Putin. I wouldn't, I wouldn't make that a red line at the moment. I'd say we want a, we want a democratic, civilised state. At the moment, you've got a repressive state 
with a civilised society. It's, it's really weird, a liberal society. Churches alongside mosques, women not wearing veils, you name it. And you want to maintain that peace whilst uh, rebuilding Syria. So yes, I'd talk to Putin, I'd talk to, uh, I'd talk to the Assad government. Uh, and bear mm. in mind, this was here, by the way, before Bashar Assad took over. His father created the yes, regime we have now. Indeed. So the machinery is important too. It's been know. there for a long time, so, absolutely. So you, so you have to sort that out too. Very, very interesting. Um, since you're um, a leading enthusiast for the Leave side of the argument, let me ask you about Ken Clark's comment uh, this week. The Prime Minister wouldn't last 30 <laughs> seconds if we vote to Brexit. No, I, you asked me if I agree with that. Yes. No, I, no, I don't. Uh, look, if we, uh, if we vote for Brexit, then it's clear that David Cameron can't lead that bit of his, of his government's activities. He'd have to appoint... What, the renegotiation? The renegotiation, exactly. Uh, he'd have to appoint somebody who the public had uh, faith in, who his own party had faith in, but most importantly, who believed in the negotiation. Uh, if he did that, I don't see any reason why he shouldn't go on. I mean, listen... So, so what kind is, of person... Is, we're talking about somebody who's been on the Leave campaign yeah, side. I mean, there are a number of... There are a a number. Boris or a Gove, or somebody who's been in the Foreign Office, David. Oh, go away. Let us... You're, you're, yeah. you're referring to me. Let us, let, us, let us confine ourselves to the plausible, shall we? OK. OK, <laughs> but if he, if he brought in a Gove or a Johnson, mm. to do the renegotiation. Yeah. Do you think he could then remain as Prime yeah, Minister? I think, I, I think so. Um, I, think if he, I think if he made it plain that he was going to give those, those people enough power to, to do the job. David Davis, thank you very much indeed for thank joining you. us.